your reaction is that um, we did a story about three businessmen who are here in Canada. They're accused by the U.S. of being involved in a, a scheme that lasted more than 15 years to help Iran's regime evade U.S. sanctions, including disguising more than $750 million, including disguising the purchase of two oil tankers. The Prime Minister just said um, that Canada has sanctions in place, the authorities are they're working with authorities and uh, the Iranian community to target people of interest. What do you say in response to um, him saying, look, we have sanctions for this, when sanctions do not target people that, that live here in Canada? So that's exactly it. So first of all, the sanctions that we have in place are not, uh, are not wide enough. Uh, we've been consistently calling for listing the IRGC as the terrorist organization that they are, and I think that will stop those from coming here, uh, not only who have uh, riches from, uh, from the regime and have, uh, uh, have gained those riches, from uh, from actually being part of the regime, but those who are intimidating Canadians on Canadian soil, and we know that they live here in Canada. And where possible, we've got to expel those who are here uh, and are known to be connected to uh, to the regime. And the RCMP should do that. He's been denied the allegations. They're not accused at this point of breaking any laws in Canada. So what should the government be doing in response to a case like this, where they, their lawyer says they are Canadians, they live in the country? What can they, the government do? So the IRGC itself is allowed to organize to uh, uh, to raise money here and those close to the regime are to do that too where it is possible I think that's where law authorities should get involved the RCMP should get involved and expel those people from Canada if they are found to be breaking Canadian laws it's been uh, almost two years since the US indictment came out it's unclear if there's been an extradition request from the US because that's confidential until it goes to court so we, we don't understand or know what's going on with that but what does it say to you that nearly two years later these individuals have not been extradited they're now operating other businesses in the world of real estate that are not named in the US indictment it says what we've been saying all along to this government, that there are actors from the, uh, from this regime, Canadians who are tied to this regime, uh, that are intimidating, that are raising money, that are organizing, uh, and that are getting, or that are or that have gotten rich from the regime itself. We have said that, they are here in Canada, and we should use every part of, uh, uh, of our own authorities to make sure that they're not. Thank you. Is there a guideline for funding for sensitive areas? Um, governments announced new guidelines. Do you think that that's enough? Uh, on uh, with regard to the minister's announcement yesterday exactly, yeah. in China, yeah. uh, no, because this government has spent a lot of times over the last seven years and eight years approving Chinese takeovers of critical Canadian companies, like the only producing lithium mine in Manitoba without national security reviews, our telecommunications businesses like Hytera, a Chinese state-owned enterprise, taking over Norsat. So they don't go far enough in dealing with the issue of Chinese uh, interference in our economy. What more should the government be doing and should, be they, should be they be talking to premiers about this? Well, the minister introduced uh, the Investment Canada Act changes, Bill C-34, which was debated in the House last week. And in my speech, I said it doesn't go far enough. It doesn't deal with outright automatic reviews for state-owned enterprises from China. That should be part of the legislation so that it is not just up to the discretion of the minister. And guidelines just alone, um, what do you think of that coming up now? Well, guidelines, the guidelines uh, that they've put out, they didn't, the Liberals haven't even lived up to their guidelines on critical minerals. They put out guidelines on critical minerals and then have approved other uh, takeovers of our uh, mining industries and lithium uh, and ignored their own, own guidelines. So guidelines aren't very strong. I think you have to spend more time. Uh, the Liberals have to spend more time looking at the actual legislative elements of what's in the Investment Canada Act. Uh, I think they should... Uh, uh, I've met with all the heads of the granting councils who also told me that over 90% of what they do is matched by either foreign multinationals or, or government money uh, from other states and that, uh, that uh, they had never been given any direction not to do that, which is shocking. Also, I think he should be talking immediately with the premiers to insist that the universities that they oversee that this uh, ban of, of uh, Chinese uh, army uh, research that's going on on artificial intelligence and supercomputing in our universities is stopped. Uh, we covered a story yesterday about three, uh, three individuals who are businessmen here in Canada that the U.S. has accused in an indictment of um, violating U.S. sanctions. The government has said that they are, the men say that, they, that the allegations are baseless. The government has said Canada will not be a safe haven for anyone benefiting from Iran's regime. What do you think the government should do now in response? 
Well, again, whether it's Iran, whether it's China, uh, uh, they've been very weak on dealing with these issues after the fact. So uh, in the case, for example, where we had the RCMP purchasing telecommunications equipment from a Chinese state-owned enterprises, uh, enterprise that came out in December in the Canadian Border Services Agency, after the fact they said, oops, well, don't worry, it's not, uh, it's not a problem for us because it's not a critical element of communications. So they're sort of always doing these things after it happens. They come out and, and, and deal with this in the case of Hytera, uh, uh, which owns this company. They were charged with 21 counts of espionage in the United States in January last year, banned by President Biden from doing business in the U.S., and eight months later, the RCMP gave them a contract. So they don't seem to be on top of the game. When I was in industry committee, I asked the RCMP if they knew eight months after that, that they had been, that Hytera had been charged with 21 counts of espionage in the United States, and the RCMP said no, they weren't aware of it when they gave the contract, which is shocking to me. Thank you. I'm okay, how are you doing? Things are good, things are good in the writing. Things are, well, no, we had a big closure, our big, biggest private sector employer, um, the Canopy Growth Company, they did the, so that's, a loss of hundreds of jobs, so and, and, not as good. Yeah, and the cannabis industry is coming today to talk about that. That's sure. right, they are. Yeah, with good reason, because uh, there's some issues with the way they're taxed and regulated, to say the least. So what would you like, what kind of changes would you like to see? Because they're asking the, to change the excise taxes, for yeah, example? Yeah. Well, the, 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 the answer in short, the short answer on, on that is, you have to create a situation in which legal producers of cannabis are able to be priced competitively. If you don't do that, the majority of the supply will continue to be as it now is from the illegal sector. It's, it's, it's simple economics, right? Supply and demand, and uh, people are going to go where the price is best. You've got to take that into account. So, do you, so you'd like the government to listen to what the cannabis industry is saying, uh, which is reduce the excise taxes? The cannabis industry has been saying this for several years, and the government hasn't been listening, so I would like that very much. Okay, and what's the impact in your community to see uh, the cannabis grow? Oh, well, they're our biggest private sector employer. They're like number one in, in, in the riding, so it's. Uh, it's really going to hurt uh, Smith Falls. Uh, to, uh, it's going to knock the stuffing out of Smith Falls, uh, you know, to be honest. After Hershey, right? Yeah, well, Hershey's was a long time ago, but yes, it's the Hershey facility. It's the old Hershey facility, for sure. Hope that's helpful. Merci. Okay. Est-ce que les PDG d'entreprises de Charles Fédéral devraient absolument parler le français? Bonne question. Parce qu'hier, au comité, les conservateurs et les libéraux ont... Au Québec. Au Québec, en Ontario, au Canada, CN, etc. Tu crois au Québec, au moins. Partons du Québec. Parce qu'hier, les conservateurs et les libéraux ont voté ensemble au comité sur cette presse pour dire non, nous, c'est pas important. Alors que le Bloc et les néo-démocrates disaient oui, il faut qu'ils devraient qu'ils parlent français. Je n'ai pas d'opinion. J'en ai une pour le Québec, là. Donc, c'est pas votre question. Je au Québec, il faut qu'ils parlent français. Oui. Donc, par mais exemple, on ferait ça comment? Ouais. Parce que les, les, les mais la, la, de la... travail sont peut-être basés à Québec, mais... Oui, mais la langue de travail au Québec, c'est le français. Mm. Je parle de ce principe-là. Là. Mm -hmm. Si vous avez un patron qui ne parle pas français, c'est pas un exemple à donner beaucoup là, mm. au reste des autres patrons. Mais comment on pourrait faire ça dans des lois, dire euh, les hein? sociétés d'État qui sont... Mais M. Trudeau, ce n'est pas, pas engagé à appliquer la loi 101 aux organisations fédérales? Mm. Et je vous les lèvres. Mm. Okay. <rire> Bonne journée tout le monde.